Okay, so uh, we're going to start with some worship. So if you're uh, here in person, you could, you could stand. Maybe try not to sing directly at other people. Um, Shouldn't we ev- never sing to other people? Just Well, like at them physically, <laughs> like stuff's coming out of your mouth. I don't know. Let's worship. <laughs>
As we come into your presence, we remember every blessing that you poured out so freely from above. Lifting gratitude and praises for compassion so amazing. Lord, we come to give you thanks for all you've done. Because of your love, we're forgiven. Because of your love, our hearts are clean. We lift you up with songs of freedom. Forever we're changed because of your love. Because of your love, we're forgiven. Because of your love, our hearts are clean. We lift you up with songs of freedom. Forever we're changed because of your love. Spirit, we are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our Um, so uh, it's, it's, again, just to say it, it's good to see faces. Um, I don't, you know, it's, it's been weird. I mean, it's, I'm sure it's been weird for many of you too. I'm not alone, but preaching to usually like three faces, right? Like Wendy would be somewhere over here, Dustin here, and one of my kids over there, and then the guys up in the balcony. Um, so yeah, so I'm just I'm glad to see people. Um, also, um, you know, we got to make sure that we're, we're keep, keeping each other in mind in this whole entire process, whether it be with our distancing and those that are uh, at home right now that uh, feel like that's the best place for them to be and we want them to be safe and good. So um, a couple of quick announcements and then we're just going to jump in. Um, probably the biggest one uh, that will affect the most people, in fact, it will affect people that don't even know they're being affected yet. Um, the locks have been changed in the church. And uh, so if you have a key 
it don't work. Um, so uh, don't, don't keep trying. You're just going to set the alarm off. Uh, but uh, there is actually now also uh, we have an electronic key entry uh, at the front. Um, and that requires a little little card thing that you swipe near it. Uh, so yeah, we're fancy. And uh, so if, you, uh, if you're in a ministry and you're in need of one of those that you, and, and that's, that makes sense for you to have one, we're not just passing them out because there are probably more copies of the, the old church key in this town than have ever attended this church ever. Um, so uh, anyhow, uh, yeah, see Gary. Uh, there's a little form that we want you to sign off on so that you understand the responsibility of that card. Uh, the alarm code has also been changed uh, for the longest time. It's been one hour. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm already forgot it. So, um, but uh, anyhow, uh, all of those things. So, see Gary, though, for, for more details there. Um, and then, um, let's see, I think well, yeah, one, uh, we've, people have been asking, because I talked a little bit about last week, we're still working out uh, details about uh, the possibility of doing a midweek small group type thing, um, and, uh, and so we're, we're thinking of doing one here at the church, so we'll do it in the fellowship hall where we can be nicely spaced, um, and then uh, uh, it, it'll be like a big small group probably, because uh, we'll take the other small groups that we, we launched small group one week before we had to shut down, so we're just going to pick up from there, um, and then uh, we're talking about actually doing one that's an online one. Um, and so we're working out the logistics there. So those are, those are some of the announcements that need to be made. I think otherwise, are we good? To, we're good to go. All right. All right. So let's, let's pray again. Father, God, we do thank you again so much for this morning. And Father, I thank you for this time. Lord, I thank you for your word. Father, I just ask now that as we've gathered together here and those that are joining us at home, that Father, that you would just, uh, Lord, you would remind us of who we are, what it is that you've called us to be. And Lord, in those areas that... Um, I don't know, Lord, those, those points of contention that we can sometimes have. Lord, help us to understand what it means to lay those things down. We just uh, give you all the praise and all the glory. Amen. So last week, uh, we skimmed through uh, Romans 14 um, and uh, doing the whole chapter overview. Now we're going to go back through it and we're going to walk through it a little bit slower. So with that, let's go ahead and just jump into Romans 14, starting in verse 1. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. So real quick here, let's just get it out of the way. This is not an anti-vegetarian message. Um, this is, uh, if you want to eat Bob the tomato, that's fine. If you want to save Bob, that's cool too. Um, but it's really not about whether or not eating a vegetable diet. That's not what Paul's talking about. So if you remember last week, last week we, we looked at the, uh, at the passage and it's this weak versus strong. And what we're saying there is weak in faith or strong in faith. And what that means is to say what their faith depends on. Uh, we're talking about a faith that is in the fullness of the gospel or is it a faith that somehow relies on the gospel to be supplemented. Uh, and so what I mean by that is there's like additional things that they, they have decided that their, their faith needs to be secure. For instance, Paul's using the example of food and whether or not to eat certain foods and whether or not my faith is dependent on those things rather than on Christ. Now, when I say the fullness of the gospel, what we're saying is this, understanding that Christ died once and died once for all, okay? So to help us to grab that, what we're going to do is we're going to actually jump back to Romans 6 for a moment. For if we have been united with him in death, in a death like his, 
we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we no longer uh, be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. So what we have here is we have this picture of what the resurrection means for us, right? That we identify in that, everything that Christ accomplished in that. So now, verse 9, we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion or mastering over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So that you must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So it's through the death of Jesus, his sacrifice, that we are reconciled with God our Creator that in that we have a fullness of unity, and that's found because of the resurrection. Now, Paul would say in other letters that if there's no resurrection, then there's no gospel. And if there's no resurrection, there's no good news. There's, there's, in fact, if there's no resurrection and we've been living as if we're free from sin because of the resurrection, but there hasn't been a resurrection, then we ought to be very, very pitied because we really lived a wrong life. We're still found to be in our sin. But instead, we recognize that the work of Christ, his death and resurrection, but his death was complete, lacking nothing. There's nothing to add to it. There's nothing to supplement to it. There's nothing to continue doing it. Um, I, I've heard people talk functionally. Well, yeah, yeah, Jesus saved me, but now I must, right? And, and it's as if that must is required to make the salvation still true to make it stick or something. Now, yes, there, there's an act of repentance, but that's not, be, that's not to be saved. It's because you are saved, right? We, repentance, remember, repentance is simply walking away from what we ought not to and going towards what we ought to. At the same time, I've heard people say, in fact, I was actually observing a Sunday school teacher one time, um, and they taught this, and, and, and they weren't teaching it maliciously. They're trying to get a point to, across to a bunch of little kids. But they said this, that every time you sin, it's like you put Jesus back on the cross. That's not true. That's not true at all. We don't put Jesus back on the cross. That would be to say he died, and well, it didn't stick, so we had to do it again, right? Um, he died once and for all. Everything that happened at the cross reverberates forwards and backwards throughout time. It is sufficient for all mankind. There isn't something that we, well, that we add to it. We could take some time. I say we could. We're going to. We're going to take some time in Hebrews 10 here for a second here and, and take a look. In fact, by the way, reading Romans in parallel with Hebrews, highly recommend it. Um, but we look at, at Hebrews 10, and 10 begins this way. It says, for since the law has but a shadow of good things to come. Now, just keep in mind real quick here what a shadow is. You have a, uh, when you produce a shadow, the shadow is not you right? It's something that your solid form has produced. So in the same respect, what we're saying is the work of Christ, who Jesus is, that's demonstrated in the shadow, okay? The, the thing that it gets laid out. So since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifice they are continually offered every year make perfect those who draw near. In other words, they keep going back every year doing the same sacrifice every year. Otherwise, would they not cease to be offered since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. And what we start to see here is that there's this participation in sacrifice done every year. It doesn't, it's never, the sacrifice wasn't designed to just save you. It was to remind you you need saved. And, and so we have this picture, and it's a shadow, meaning it's something to represent. So when we see the ultimate sacrifice, we'd understand it, we'd get it. And we'd also know, again, going back to that, we don't put Jesus back on the cross every year. I, I know people go through different forms of um, you know, reigniting their faith, right? Uh, they, they reestablish their faith. That's, that's not what this is talking about. This is saying like as if suddenly I need to keep doing this in order to maintain salvation. Uh, if I want to keep shopping at Costco, for instance, I have to maintain a membership. I have to keep paying my dues. Salvation doesn't have dues that you keep paying every year, 
Okay, so we keep going now. In, in this particular passage in Hebrews, the writer um, is using some Old Testament scriptures and then explaining them. We're skipping over the Old Testament portion and just looking at what he's explaining. Okay, so jumping to verse 8. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offering and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that, we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And so we see an order. The first sacrifices were designed so that when the second, the will of God, his son, it's understood. That we would look at it and go, this is clearly different. In fact, even if you stop and you think about that moment, uh, Jesus on the cross, and the, even the Roman soldier gets it. Surely this is the son of God. Suddenly, like, this is not normal. There's something else at work. And so we then continue on into verse 19. Therefore, brothers, okay, so as, as this big conclusion, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, that is to enter the holy of holies, a place that only a very select few would ever walk into. Now we get to walk in there because of the blood of Jesus by the new and living way that he opened it up. See, new and living way that he opened up uh, the curtain. So the, the, we know the veil to be torn, right? That is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he, promise, uh, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another in love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. And again, even that picture of just a yearly sacrifice, and that's it. Sometimes maybe, um, do we treat Christianity that way? I just go to church once a year and I'm good, right? I just, I just, I'll, just, I'll just hit Easter and maybe Christmas, one or the other, and, and that's good, right? And that's, that's not it. Instead, it's a new and a living way, something that's supposed to be a continual action, not a once in a while thing, as in some are the habit of doing once in a while right? It, it's a full assurance of faith, which that's actually what faith is. It's full assurance, right? It's understanding that. It's, it's interesting, though, when we tackle things like the law and whatnot, that there are some Christians, okay? And when I say Christian, I'm talking about somebody who proclaims Christ as Lord, okay? We see some Christians participating in parts of the law, but not other parts of the law. And it's interesting that they would take pieces of it. For instance, I don't see a whole, I, I, I'm not even sure if I know of any evangelical church at all that celebrates sacrificing lambs, right? I, like they have an altar and all that kind of stuff. But yet I do know evangelical churches who will impose dietary laws, and they will suggest that, that we're still under dietary laws. It's, it's interesting to me that we would take some of the law and say, yep, we're going to keep doing that. But some of these other laws, we're going to say, no, we're not going to do that. And I think that kind of takes us back to that place of when we start looking at, well, yeah, Jesus took care of the sacrifice portion, but I have to take care of the other stuff. And it's like, no, if Jesus fulfilled the law, he fulfilled the law. So either he fulfilled the law in full or he didn't fulfill any of it, because that's how the law works. It's, it's all or nothing. So either he fulfilled it, or he didn't. It's not a matter of, well, he fulfilled this portion of it. And remember, it's important, Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. We know this, right? That, that is to say, get rid of it, make it cease to exist. He came to fulfill the law, meaning he meets its demands, all of its demands. And the way that works is once a demand is met, there's nothing left owing. And we participate in that by being in Christ. Just like we began with, we, rec we, we recognize his death. We're in his death. We recognize his resurrection. We're in his resurrection. We're in the fulfillment of the law because we're in him, not because of anything we've done. The demand of the law can't be met by one person, at least not without repeating it year after year after year, right? But it was never intended. It was always intended as a shadow of things to come. 
Most people will grasp that, and yet we'll still try to fulfill some sort of version of the law in our life, almost as if it's a, a, a backup plan for salvation. Well, yeah, I, I believe Jesus, but just in case, I'm going to do this too. But nowhere in the scripture do we see anything other than faith alone saving, faith alone in Christ, not faith in the law, but faith alone in Jesus. And that's given to us by the act of God's grace alone. Okay, so what do we do when someone thinks differently on this? How do we have that conversation? What do we do with a brother or sister who perhaps has, I don't know, handpicked a few of the laws and said, nope, those ones still. What do we do? Well, if we go back to Romans, and we talked about this verse last week somewhat, um, but verse one, first, don't pick a fight. No quarrels. Easier said than done. Um, uh, what I want to do here is I want to take a look at this particular verse uh, separately for a second here by looking at it in different translations, right? In fact, I've, I've told you uh, many a times if you've been with us, the best way to study the scripture is to use multiple translations to help us understand it, right? Uh, it's not about having a wonderful library of books um, that uh, we can see how other people understand it, but for you, I think the very first step, the best step, is to take it and read it in a couple of translations and see what the word changes might be because I think that'll help us better understand it. So that's what I want to do. So here we start with the ESV. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. Cool. NIV, which is probably the, the most common translation in most people's homes. Accept the ones whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. So you'll, real quick here, you'll notice that faith is weak, weak in faith. Flip those around. Hopefully to help us to understand what we're talking about there, okay? It's, it, we're talking about the faith not the person, the faith is weak, okay? But then we have this word disputable matters, right? So whereas before we have uh, over opinions, so opinions and disputable matters, okay? So we start to see things that we don't agree on is what the, the idea would be, right? So then let's jump over to the Holman. Except anyone who is weak in faith, but don't argue about doubtful issues. So suddenly now we're singling out, these aren't just your opinion versus their opinion, it's to say the things they've landed on are the disputable thing, the, the, the thing that maybe, well, I'm not sure where in the scripture you're getting that from, right? Then we can jump over to the NET. This is the New English translation. This is, this is the youngest of the translations on the, on the board here. Um, it's a really good translation. I, I really enjoy the NET, um, but in the battle of new translations, the ESV won. Um, so the NET didn't get quite the traction it does. But nonetheless, now receive the one who is weak in the faith. You'll notice how the very beginning of those, those don't really change much, do they? And do not have disputes over differing opinions. So now we're starting to see the greater picture. They're saying this one thing. You don't see it in the scripture. How do we have this? Let's not fight over it. Then let's go to the standard of all standards, the new American. Now, and this is the 95 version. That's, that's all you need. Now, accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinion. So now we're starting to get even a broader picture here. Not only is this not about the person, right, but it's about what the person believes, and then it's about passing a judgment on the thing they believe, not putting the judgment on the person. You're not saying, oh man, you're really dumb for thinking that. It's like, no, that's a dumb thing to think about. But we don't say dumb because that would be a quarreling kind of word, right? We're not here just to, to simply rip them apart. Also, uh, not for the purpose of passing judgment. And is the, you don't look at them and say, oh, well, bless their heart. You know, that's, that's, that's cute, right? Let's not, let's not do that. Let's not bring them in just so that we can mock them, right, is for their opinion either, right? Now, all of these, real quick here, all of these are accepted translations, right? And, and again, talking about reading more than one translation, because let's face it, uh, often translating from, uh, from original languages over to English, English loses a certain nuance 
sometimes. And it's hard to find that right phrasing sometimes to get it there. These, by the way, all the translations I've used here in particular are all from original text, okay? They're not coming out of other translated texts. They're not coming out of, uh, from Latin to English or, or any of those kind of things, okay? So here uh, we're talking about those that came from um, uh, purely original text. They follow certain rules in their translation. Some of them are literal word for word. Some are phrase for phrase, uh, meaning a sentence, because sometimes one Greek word is a whole English sentence. Okay, it's just how it works sometimes. In some cases, in most cases, the translations come out of a grammatical or a syntax um, uh, rule. But I thought, you know, these are, these are literal translations. That's what we call these. So I thought this would be a good time to show you this verse also in a paraphrase. I think paraphrases are nice because they're good to read. They're horrible to study with, okay? The reason they're horrible to study with is because they're not designed to study. They're designed to help understand. They extrapolate. And in most cases, they expand on, like they re-preach, the verse is what they, they do. So this particular one, this is coming out of the message. Now, just real quick here, just keep in mind, this is Romans 14.1 in ESV, uh, one simple sentence, right? This is the message. Same verse. Welcome with open arms, fellow believers who don't see anything the way you do. And don't jump all over them every time they do or say something you don't agree with. Man, we could use that on Facebook, I think. Even when it seems that they are strong on opinions but weak in the faith department, remember, they have their own history to deal with. Treat them gently, okay? Obviously, it's very stretched out, right? It's over-explaining all of these words. But I think one of the pluses to the paraphrase for this moment right here is this. It's, it's Eugene Peterson, who's the translator here, his use of the word fellow believers. Because that's one of those little nuances that it's implied in the verse by saying weak in the faith. In the faith is to imply we're talking about other believers. We're, we're not just talking about people who have weird ideas. We're saying these are indeed saved individuals, but they're saved with a mindset of something here that doesn't, it doesn't run parallel with what we, what we understand. And it's to help us to understand that, but it's help, helping them to understand where maybe they're holding on to something that they shouldn't be or they don't need to be. And, and this becomes key in the arguments being made by Paul. Paul's not saying, you know what, this is what church is. Let's just all agree to disagree. He's not saying that here. Paul does believe there is a correct line of thinking. And in many of the cases, those who are weak in the faith, they're, they're hinging their faith on something that's not about faith at all. And so they need, to, they need to learn that. And remember, we talked about this last week. When Jesus talks about going and making disciples, what's the instruction? Teaching them how to observe all that I commanded, meaning you do what I told you to do so they can see it. That's making the disciple. The disciple isn't telling them what to do. It's showing them how to do it. And, and so it has to be this observable thing. Well, you welcome somebody who perhaps doesn't necessarily believe what you believe. They're, they're not, they're not, not, we're not talking weird, strange outliers. We're just saying they, they've got some interesting extra ideas. Maybe it's from old traditions or something. And so you welcome them in so you can show them why they don't have to hinge things on those anymore. So the example Paul uses is food, and he also continues on even with days of worship. So in going into verse 2, and we talked about this last week, there's a lot of reasons why somebody might choose to be in, well, using dietary laws. The, the, it's really primarily about uh, understanding something to be unclean versus clean or kosher, okay? So one in a weaker faith might feel that unclean foods are still off limits. They haven't learned unclean foods aren't unclean anymore. That might be self-imposed, like they read it, like, I, well, I read Deuteronomy, and Deuteronomy tells me, so I guess I'm going to go with that, right? It could be that. It could be that they're coming, they're a Jewish convert, and they're coming out of being raised that way, and quite frankly, to do anything different would feel like a betrayal to some extent, and not understanding it's not, and so it's not just, you, you don't teach somebody by simply shoving bacon in front of them. Although I'm sure bacon will convert most anybody, but that's just a whole nother issue, right? 
No, it, it, it's really, it's about them observing. Why? Why is that not true? Teaching them why that might not be true. Now, avoiding all meat, by the way, being vegetarian, if you will. They, I'm not sure they, I don't know what the Greek word for vegetarian is, but, but here, avoiding all meat, that's not a law thing, by the way. That's not in the law at all. Now, there are certain vows that somebody might take, but as a whole, just abstaining from meat, period, that's not a law thing. So now we're starting to see, oh, maybe their reasoning is different. And again, it goes back to the unclean notion, right? So maybe they're saying, no, I'm just going to do the vegetable thing. It's rather be safe than sorry because, well, well, we're in a Greco-Roman world. And a lot of the meat being sold in the, the meat markets were used to participate in worshiping other things. So I don't want to be connected to that and thinking maybe that's an issue. It could be because you're in a, well, a Greco-Roman world that um, you've got butchers who could care less whether or not this knife cut a pig one minute and something else another minute. So that's just cross-contamination at that moment, right? That's, that's just proximity. So let's be safe rather than sorry, but see, that's built on a foundation that you cannot eat unclean things or that that's still in play. Now, there's a, a Bible study method called hermeneutics that we have to start to work with here. What does that mean? It means when we're not sure how to apply or how this verse is used, we look at other verses where it is addressed, perhaps even addressed a little bit more simple, and then we say, okay, how do these mesh together, okay? And so what's the usual go-to hermeneutic passage on whether or not food is clean or unclean? It's not the only passage. We're going to look at a couple of them this morning, but the primary one that most people go to. Uh, it's a passage some people refer to it as Peter's picnic. Uh, this is Acts chapter 10. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray, and he became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened up, something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. And in it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call uncommon. This happened three times. The thing was taken up at once to heaven. Okay. So real quick here, notice uh, some similarities in Peter's arguments with Jesus in this particular passage. If you remember when Jesus goes to wash uh, Peter's feet, right? Peter's like, no, 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 no. You, you shouldn't be washing my feet. After all, I mean, his feet are unclean and Jesus is the master. He shouldn't be touching unclean things. And, and Jesus says, no, you, you need to. And so Peter refuses, Jesus rebukes him. And then Peter's response is what? In that case, give me a bath, right? Wash my whole thing. Like he goes overboard on it, right? It, it, it goes past the symbolic gesture of making him clean at that moment, right? Peter argues with him. He even argues over the issue of, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. And then he does it how many times? Three times. And so three times the Lord has to present this argument to do this. There are those who will make this argument concerning this passage something else, Right? For those who say, no, no, we have to, and I've had this conversation, we, we have to stick to the dietary laws. And, and then you bring up uh, Acts 10, because Acts 10 should settle it. And it doesn't settle it with them because they've turned everything in Acts 10 into symbology. And this is the symbology. After all, Jesus told us that we're supposed to go and make disciples. And where are we supposed to go to make disciples? Well, to the four corners of the world. There's four corners of the blanket, right? And, and what is unclean? Well, Gentiles are unclean. So we're talking really about Gentiles coming into the fold. And they will make this passage about that. But here's, there's one particular error in that hermeneutic. What symbolic gesture do we see anywhere within the scripture of killing and eating somebody? Why in the world would the Lord say it, not once, not twice, but three times, kill and eat? What does that have to do with discipleship? What does that have to do with Gentiles? It has nothing to do with them in that way. So we can't, let's not misuse this passage. This passage is clearly saying the Lord has made what? All things clean. Does it mean you have to change your diet? No. 
Does it mean that the opportunity is there? Yes. Why is the opportunity there? Well, this does go to discipleship. Because first off, we're talking about, is there a change in the law? And that's usually somebody's argument. Why would the Lord change the law? He didn't change the law. The law has been fulfilled. So therefore, the law is not required. We no longer live by the law. That's what needs to be understood here. We also know that all the law, regardless, is always fulfilled by how? By loving your neighbor, which includes Gentiles. And now what Peter actually has been given in this and what all the Jewish believers in particular have been given in this is this. If you hope to go into a Gentile's home with the hope of reaching them with the gospel and yet you turn around and refuse their hospitality, you're not going to get anywhere with the gospel with them. So you eat what's been put in front of you because God has made it clean for this purpose so that you might have this meal and this conversation with them. You are not restricted here so that you're free here. I've shared the story before, but when I was in high school, I was invited to have uh, lunch after church with Bruce Ware and his family. And that was a, a, a pretty big deal, a pretty intimidating thing for me. And, uh, and they're very, uh, very formal. I mean, Bruce, I mean, Bruce was a seminary professor at the time and, and uh, uh, wore suits to church and all this kind of stuff. And I didn't. Um, I wasn't even close to it. I didn't even tuck my shirt in. Uh, still don't. Um, but, uh, but nonetheless, I, I, we, I go to his house, and, and I'm sitting there, and, uh, and the food's getting passed around the table. Well, around the corner comes a big bowl, and I mean, it was like the biggest bowl in the world, I'm sure of, um, but a big bowl of peas, green peas. I don't like peas, all right? It's just no, I just not a pea person, okay? And, and so here comes the bowl of peas, and so what do I do? Well, at my household, the rule is this. If you don't want to eat it, you don't have to, but at the same time, <laughs> you don't eat, right? I mean, that's just your choice at that moment. Well, so I do what I would have done. I took the bowl, and I passed it on, right? It's no big deal. I didn't think it was a big deal, and it really wasn't, but at that moment, here's what did happen, though. As I passed it, I passed it to little Bethany Ware. She's not little anymore, but at the time she was little and she was the most articulate little girl I have ever met in my entire life. She was just crazy smart, right? And I pass her this bowl of peas and the she then takes the bowl of peas and then she passes them to her mom, Jody. To which Jody then turns around and <laughs> passes them back to Bethany and says, you need to take peas. And which Bethany quickly articulates very accurately, but Mike did not take peas. To which Jody said, I am not Mike's mother and Mike is big enough to make those decisions you will have peace. At which I start to interrupt that moment by saying, I will take the peas, right? I don't want to cause turmoil here. I did not realize the offense. That, and Jody assured me there was no offense. That if I don't want peas, I don't have to have peas. But Bethany will have peas, <laughs> you know? And, and so, and Bethany had peas. And then I'm like feeling really bad for Bethany at that moment, like, I'm going to eat peas, right? And I ended up, I ate some peas, okay? But, but it was like that moment, though, like, I could have caused this, this huge debacle. Um, now, on a different kind of level, I've been to a lot of different countries. In a lot of different countries, while food is always a commonality, everybody eats, some places are a little bit more, it's about what's served, and there's an honor to it. And in one particular case, that was my case in Japan, and I ate a lot of things in Japan that I have not eaten since. I don't desire to eat again, but I ate. But in particular, there was one particular meal at a, at a family's home, and sitting in front of me, and they actually explained it, which made it even worse, um, was there was this little stone pot. I've shared this before. The little stone pot, and inside the pot was this, the best way to describe it and to understand it was it was a poached egg, but it had been fermented for days. Um, and, and then there was a very large, and this was the real big, this is the, the big killer to it, a huge shiitake mushroom, um, put, you know, like stem and all pushed into it, right? And it's all made as this thing. And it's a big deal because it takes days and days and days to prepare. And everybody at the table was very, with the exception of some of us, Americans, right, was very excited about this being on the table. This was a big deal. 
And um, I'm just, re- I'm, I, I can't do it, Lord. I mean, I'm, my primary food problem is texture, right? And this has got all the notes of wrong texture in every way, shape, and form, plus it's a mushroom, right? Mushrooms are fungus, that's the devil. And, and so I, I'm like, I just can't do it, Lord. I can't, do, and I am praying, and I am praying harder than I have ever prayed in my life. Lord, I don't know what to do here. I can't do this. I know I can't do I'm gonna make a worse scene by doing it than not doing it, but I have to do it. Right? And, and somewhere along the line, um, I was sitting next to their youngest son, and he leaned over to me, and uh, he looked at me and he says, are you going to eat that? And he's pointing at it, right? But he's being very quiet. He does not want mom and dad to know he's asking me. And I'm picking up on this. I'm like, oh, wait. And I look over, and his is gone. Like, it's scraped clean. And, and I'm like, did, did, did you need another one? Like, <laughs> I get to play the hospitality, right? I mean, you can't refuse me. And uh, I'm like, do you, do you, would you like another one? He goes, oh, this is my favorite. And, but he's being super quiet because he doesn't want mom and dad to know that he might be taking this treat from me, right? And I'm like, sure. And we're secretly like, <laughs> like, you know, I put the empty one in front of me. He takes that one. I'm just, I want to remind you, Jesus saves. And, and it, it's the... <laughs> It's to understand that. But, but seriously, there's just that moment, like, what do I do? I, it's such a weird thing. And, and, and so maybe we need to be ready to lay down our freedom in those moments. It's not about whether this believer, this other believer is weak or not, right? Especially if you're strong. You're the one who needs to make the shift at that moment. So there's a reminder here that Paul's getting at also is that, that we have this, uh, this place where we got to be careful what we're doing in terms of our, our judging, right? Uh, in fact, uh, later on in, in the same Romans chapter, we, we'll, we'll come to later when we get there, but just a reminder. Verse 20, do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean. So see, there's another passage. Everything is indeed clean. But it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. Because we're supposed to be looking out for the weaker brother. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because he eats what he is eating is not from faith, for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So there might be issues uh, as to why they do or they don't, and we've got to be careful with some of those issues. We have to remember, reminded, not to judge just for the sake of judging. I'm right, you're wrong, get with it. That's, that's not the goal. And there, and there might be very well-intended uh, a vow of some sort in place, or it might just be a simple enough decision. I'm just not going to, right? Uh, I, I've shared in my own life, I, I, I don't drink, right? Um, I, I never have. Some people find that very surprising. And I, okay, I got to put a little caveat, because every time I say I never have, my dad reminds me of a time, and he has a picture uh, when I was like this big, uh, sitting on my grandfather's lap. Everybody probably has had this moment of some sort. And, and of course, the, well, no, my kids haven't. <laughs> um, but uh, but my, my grandfather, every day after work, he would have a beer. Now, his beer was a brown bottle with a white label that said the word beer, right? That was, that was it, right? And I remember the smell to this day. And, and anytime I smell an old penny, that's what it reminds me of, right? And, and uh, but anyway, so there's a picture where he, uh, you know, is like giving me a sip, right? And do I, re- I don't remember that, okay? Short of that, I've never drank, right? Now, there's a reason for this, though. And this actually happened before I was ever saved, right? I have extended family, who have a real issue with it. And I know myself, and I know that I have obsessive compulsive tendencies. So it might be safer not to. So I just don't. I will say this though, there was a point in time in my Christian life where it was part of my righteousness. We would actually call it self-righteous, right? I built it upon myself like I am better because I've never, and that's wrong, right? Now, is drinking alcohol wrong? Okay, no, no. And I know this is what we love to say. This is the argument. No, drinking alcohol is not wrong. We're just not supposed to get drunk. And I think that's a really weak argument to make because what is drunk, right? Are we talking legal drunk, right? Are we talking about a number that's been assigned to it? Are we talking about sword speech and motion? Because I have family who functioned higher 
intoxicated than not intoxicated. So drunk's not, that's a weak argument. It, it's not about the drinking though, right? It's to impose what you might deem wrong on others and holding it against them. I remember about 15 years ago, in fact, this is when my righteousness got called into question by God. That's a bad place to be, by the way. Um, but I was, I, was invi- I was at a CB conference, Conservative Baptist Conference. I was, at the time, I was at a church that wasn't a CB church, um, but I was still going to the conferences. And uh, uh, I was invited out by a group of pastors. They're all going out for lunch. And uh, I was honored to, to join them at that point. I was like, getting to go to the big kids' table kind of feel. And... Um, and so many of these guys I, I, I love and, and, and honor. And, and we go and we went to the Deschutes Brewery Company, right? Because everybody's talking about how they got some really good burgers. But they also have other things, right? And I sit down and here's this huge table of, of there's about 20 of us there. And, and uh, at least half of those pastors got a beer or a lager. Some of them were talking about how, look at this one. They stick a knife in it and it's like standing straight up, right? And it's like they're, they're very excited about this moment. And I'm drinking a Coke, right? And I'm feeling very awkward because I guess we're going to get in trouble, right? Like, like we're a bunch of underage kids or something. And it's because I've never been in that environment. By the way, one of the people who were with me on that day was Jeff Vanderselt. It's the first time I ever met Jeff um, and, uh, and had a wonderful friendship with him ever since. Uh, and I'll tell you right now, uh, this is the book of the month, Gospel Fluency. Um, everything that, that's in this book, I watched Jeff do 15 years ago at that particular table with our waitress. I've shared that story before. I'll save it for another time. But I'm just saying, a table full of pastors, half of them having a beer, everybody's eating a burger, and we watched the gospel happen, right? And, and it was an amazing thing. But nonetheless, I was feeling really weird about it. Well, after it was over, um, my, my mentor, uh, Luke Hendricks, he comes up to me and goes, Mike, I noticed you, you didn't have a beer. And I go, no, I, I, don't, I don't drink. He goes, did it make you feel uncomfortable? And I go, yeah, it, it kind of did. And, and then he says, Why? And we had this wonderful conversation at that moment where I realized that my uncomfortableness was, was a built on an idea that didn't exist about a righteousness with it. And the Lord really laid that down. Doesn't mean I go running and having a drink. No, I, I, I still don't feel the need to have a drink. I've always joked that someday when I go to the homeland, right, I go back to Ireland, right, that's where I'm, my, my heritage is from, I'll have a Guinness there, and every time I say it, somebody who I know from Ireland uh, says, yeah, and you'll pass out for a sip, but probably, um, but nonetheless, right, now, this doesn't have to be distilled down, distilled down, that's a pun, um, distilled, down, uh, distilled down to just eating and drinking, right, it, it's really about exercising our freedom, and to what end, and there is a point where we might flaunt it. There's a point where we might get puffed up. We might find ourselves in arguments over it. And the whole idea is don't. That's, that's not worth the gospel to have those kind of things. If, if the law is fulfilled by loving our neighbor and the hope is to see our neighbor become our brother, then we have to evaluate what it is we do, why we do it, and and what it is that sometimes we just need to lay down. It doesn't mean everybody, quick, uh, we, we need to go run to the bar, right? But at the same time, it doesn't mean you can't enter the bar either, right? We, we just have to understand what it means to love our neighbor. Paul's addressing believers here, and that's where these arguments can start to occur. We see it in other places of Paul's writings. We go over to the first letter he writes to the uh, Corinthians, right? Uh, chapter 8, it's dealing with this whole thing with food, sacrifice to idols. And he's saying you got to be careful. Um, but at the same time, just because it was sacrificed to idols doesn't mean you can't eat it. Because after all, at the end of the day, it was sacrificed to nothing. It's just nonsense. But nonetheless, uh, if you sit down and you're eating with somebody and they say, by the way, that was sacrificed to idols for the sake of an example— step away from the plate at that moment. Say, well, I can't, I can't partake in it because I know that you, by eating this, I'm joining you in your worship of another God. So I won't do it there. There's a culpability at play. It's understanding where the right time to do this is. It's understanding that moment where we don't ever utter the words, my freedom is more important than you because my freedom is not more important than you because my freedom is not more important than the gospel. Chapter 11, then, Paul deals again with eating together, and literally he talks about the strong and the weak, but not in faith, but literally people who, who just 
don't have an ounce of strength in them. They get pushed over. They get bowled over. And you see people who are gorging themselves and they're making a mockery of the communion table in the process, not letting people get to the table because it's just all about, I'm just going to consume at the cost of my brother. And we just can't do that. In fact, uh, going back to Romans 14, verse 3, um, there's that picture that don't despise one another over these decisions. Because remember, God's welcomed them. And, and whether they abstain or don't abstain from something, that's not why God welcomed them. Now, this practice uh, is called uh, adephora. Uh, adephora is uh, where we have a practice that happens in a church that isn't either, that, that thing isn't prohibited or required for faith, right? Which really starts to take us back to what Paul says over in 1 Corinthians 6. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me. I will not be dominated by anything. Uh, Another translation uh, would say they're not profitable, right? All things are, I can do whatever I want to do. It doesn't mean I should, right? And, and in fact, this particular passage, um, Paul is talking uh, again about food, uh, food that's being sacrificed or not sacrificed or how it's being uh, presented. And he's saying, I'm not going to be controlled by that. So many people are slaves to their diets. It's bad enough when we make it a religious thing. And then at the same time, people are slaves to their freedoms. I, I won't not do something because I have the right to do it. Well, maybe not. Maybe just because you can doesn't mean you should. Now, Paul repeats this again in 1 Corinthians 10. All things are lawful, not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Eat whatever is sold in the marketplace without raising question on the ground of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the good conscience. But, and this is what we talked about earlier, if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, because in other words they're saying you're participating in it now, then don't eat it. For the sake of the one who informed you. Notice that. It's not for your sake, it's still for their sake for the sake of conscience. I do not mean your conscience, but his. For why should my liberty, my freedom, be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that which I give thanks? So, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Kind of covers all people. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. And then he continues, be imitators of me as I am Christ. It really is about looking out for others, and it's about doing it in a way that Christ did. And it's remembering what he did. He laid his life down. And we see those things here at the communion table. So real quickly, speaking of the communion table, what day should we have communion on? What's the right day to have communion on? Because the celebration of days is the other issue that's getting brought up for Paul. So continuing Romans 14, one person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, which uh, the one who abstains, abstains in the honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we we live or whether we die. Do you get the picture here? It doesn't matter what happens, right? We are the Lord's. Verse 9, for to this end Christ died and lived again, and he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. And it's understanding this, that in the same way that righteousness might be counted by what we eat or, or, or what we drink, but it also suddenly becomes even the days that we observe these things on, right? Uh, Now, for what it's worth, what is Paul addressing? He could be addressing when church is. Now, okay, let's just get some semantics out of the way. This is church. Church is people, 
Church is when people gather together. Church isn't necessarily the building, although this is the church, right? That's what we call the building. It's the church. You're the church. We're all the church, right? Uh, so let's just get all those semantics out of the way for a moment here. When normally when somebody says, when is church? What are they talking about? They're talking about the service. They're talking about that time you come together and you sing some songs and you hear a guy talk way too long about things you already know and then we move on, right? When does that happen? Well, some will say, well, that should happen on Sabbath, which is interesting because Sabbath is supposed to be a day of rest. And I would just ask you, when is the pastor supposed to be resting if he's working? Because after all, a pastor only works one day a week. So what do we do? So first off, when is Sabbath, by the way? It's Saturday. It never changed. Some people, oh, it's Sunday. It's not Sunday. What is Sunday? Sunday is known as something. It's called the Lord's Day. That's what it is. Communion, by the way, is celebrated typically on the Lord's Day, but it's not exclusive to the Lord's Day. It's to understand, first off, that Sunday is the Lord's Day. It's not Sabbath. They're not the same thing. And by the way, while we're at it, let's put it this way. Understand this, that when Jesus fulfilled the law, his promise to you, his invitation to you was to come and enter into what? His rest. We need to understand that Sabbath, what Sabbath is, what the law, the shadow of the law was to represent in the, that command to observe the Sabbath as holy is to understand this, setting apart Christ as Lord and finding your rest in him. Your Sabbath day is every day you find yourself in Jesus, which by the way, once you're his, that's every day. That's your Sabbath rest. We don't observe Sabbath practices as Christians, we're not, we don't have to. You can. You don't have to. You're not called to. That was something set aside for people that are Jewish. That is for the Jewish people. We are found ourselves in Christ in the fulfillment of the law. Therefore, we are fulfilled in his Sabbath rest. Now, could be talking about those things. It could be talking about participating in Jewish ceremonies or Jewish holidays. But I would also suggest those are for a select group of people because it's supposed to remember their history. That's what they're remembering. Now, nowhere in the scripture does it say, by the way, that you're supposed to observe things like Yom Kippur. By the way, it doesn't say that the Jewish people are supposed to celebrate. It's something that came well after the scripture. But that's not the point. The point is that there are those who think that they're supposed to keep celebrating all the Jewish holidays. In fact, some of them will actually not celebrate Easter uh, or Resurrection Sunday, if you would, or they won't celebrate Christmas, but they'll celebrate the Jewish holidays. But there's nothing in the scripture that tells us that we're supposed to do that. Again, you want to? Fine. You want to do a Passover Seder? Cool. But it, it's not required. In fact, that goes back to Hebrews 10, a shadow of things. We can go over to Colossians 2. Therefore, let, uh, let no one pass judgment on you in question of food and drink and with regards to festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are shadows of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. The solid thing, not the shadow, the solid thing is Jesus. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism of worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head whom the whole head nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. Note, they're having the exact same issues here as Paul's dealing with in the Romans, right? Food, drinks, days. You see a trend? It's, a, it's an issue, understanding what it is that we hold to, what do we don't have to hold to. It's no different today. We've got total groups of people who have gone off to one side to say it's all this or nothing. You can look at the Seventh-day Adventists. They're vegetarians. They only worship on Saturday, and they tell anybody who doesn't do those things, they're not saved. You, you could have ones of the people that are part of uh, the Hebrew Roots Movement or the Psalm 119 Ministries or the Jehovah's Witnesses. It's almost as if none of these groups have ever read Romans, let alone Romans 14. And I will say that these groups are not a matter of weaker faith. Because I would say in that case, they're not brothers. I know that's a harsh statement to say, but I just need to lay that out there. Because you know why? Because they're leading the way into arguments and despising one another if you don't do what they say, which isn't in the scripture. They've added to the gospel. So what happens? So what happens if someone is coming out of these movements? And that's, that's really where Paul's taking this. How do we take somebody who used to do it this way and get them to understand that's not the gospel and the gospel sets you free from that? 
How do we walk them through and not pass judgment? That's where we're going to be going over the next week or so. But just understand right now, Paul isn't making an argument over, you know, like, what day do you do church, right? It's critical not to impose judgment on someone's choice either. By the way, is there a specific day for church? And the answer is yes. It's all of them that end in why. We're the church seven days a week, okay? We just happen to take Sunday, you know, the Lord's Day, and say, let's set that one apart. But if you go to Saturday evening church, cool. You go to church on Wednesday for some, some church has a Wednesday, cool. When you get together with his people, your people, cool. Okay. How about communion? When is communion supposed to be done? You know, when we transitioned from having communion once a month to every week, there were some people who didn't like that. In fact, the, the, the comment that was made to me at one point in time was, um, doesn't it make it less special? And I always thought that was such an odd comment because I'm thinking, if it's special at all, first off, shouldn't we be doing it every opportunity we can? In fact, I would argue that's exactly what the scripture does say because we have to remember what communion is. This is Paul talking, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, the cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And the key to this is often. What is communion after all? Communion is a remembrance of what Jesus Christ has done. And, and so what Jesus did was he took two elements that were on the table that would be on every table every single night. Wine, bread. And he's just saying, every time you partake in these things, I want you to remember me. I am the vine after all. I am the bread after all right? He takes two common elements and to say this, that as often as you gather together. Now, here we are living in this uh, pandemic era of a world, because let's face it, this pandemic is, um, it's, it's MO is what? Touch and contact. <laughs> what is communion at the end of that? Like, there's no passing around bread to be broken at that point. If you were a germaphobe before, man, right? And, and so we have to do some changes and stuff, and I think that's something important for us to understand as we're about to go to the table, because I think some groups have taken communion, some people have taken communion, and they've made it into a ceremony, and, and not in a good way. Like, they've made it sacred unto itself. And it's not sacred in that respect. It's sacred in that it was given to us. But it's to understand the reason we partake it is not because of our righteousness, but because of his righteousness and his willingness to... <laughs> Give himself for us. When he says that, he says this, he takes that bread, he says, this is my body, I give it to you, right? He's exchanging it. And, and, and then at the same time, he takes that cup, he says, this is my blood, because the, the, the you know, he's, <laughs> any of those good Jewish boys sitting around that table would understand what he's saying. He's, you know, bulls and goats, that blood's not going to do anything for you. It's going to wear off in about 364 days. But mine's eternal. And then there's also another promise, though, and I think I want us to remember this, because maybe even doing it the way we're about to do it, you're thinking, oh, I just don't know if it's safe. That's okay. There's a difference between participating physically, because I think a lot of people can participate physically, and it means nothing. I took communion for a year before I was saved. It meant nothing to me. Just once a month, I got a piece of bread and juice in the middle of service. Cool. Right? I, I, I thought it was something else. I didn't understand what it was. So anybody can take it physically. But mentally participating, saying maybe I'm not actually grabbing the element itself, but I am taking this moment to remember what Christ did for me. And that's what communion is. And, and as we gather together, having that common unity in this. We don't have a common unity in whether or not we do or don't eat certain foods. We don't have a common unity in whether or not uh, one day is better than the other, or one law should still be observed. Or No, the only thing we have in common at the end of the day is the love that Christ has given us and that we are found in. That's what we have in common. And I would hope, I would pray, 
that we would never be found arguing that matter. I'm going to pray and invite the worship team to come forward, and you come forward as you're ready, if you want, to come grab the elements. If you weren't here at the very beginning, just a reminder, come up this aisle, go down those aisles, um, and uh, if, if at all possible, it might be easier if just one member of your family comes. There's plates here. Just load up the plate. The bread are in cups, and the juice is in cups, and then just take it back to your, to your family if, if that's the case. And if there's somebody who can't make it up, maybe you take it to them best you can. Okay, um, let's pray. Father God, we do thank you so much uh, for this morning. Father, I thank you for what's before us, the gift of your son, his obedience, obedience to the point of death. Jesus, we thank you that uh, your love for the Father is demonstrated in what you have done for us. And Spirit, as we, uh, as we gather in our unity, whether that be taking these elements um, physically or just... Uh, mentally participating, Lord. Help us just to be in awe of what it is to be united in you, in the Son, and the Father. We give you all the praise and all the glory. Amen. I love to tell the story of unseen things above. Of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know it is true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else can do. story twill be my theme and glory to tell the old old story of Jesus and his love I love to tell the story tis pleasant to repeat what seems each time I tell God's own holy word. I love to tell the story. Twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story for those Just before we uh, close, I, I was just asked, so in case people need to know, uh, we're, you know, might know, we're not passing an offering plate. Again, contact, right? So there's an offering box. It just says Barnabas on it. Um, we're using that 
So uh, envelopes and all that kind of stuff are out there. So just, just throw it into there on your way out. Just want to say thank you. Um, and uh, go live the gospel this week in a way that transcends COVID and social distancing and all those things. Don't let those things get in the way of what it means to love your neighbor this week. Um, have a good one.